Hello, I am live. It is Wednesday and it is the 21st of June. Solstice, in fact. Change of the season. We are in summer. <laughs> and it's a nice day. I am reading chapter 5 out of Life as Carola. This is a farm memory book by Joan Grant. Uh, she lived, uh, she published it, I think, in the late 30s. She passed away in 1989, amazing writer of her own far memories. And in this life, she is Carola, born on the 4th of May, 1510. It happens to be the same day as my daughter Serena's birthday, 4th of May. That's why I think it might be my favourite of hers. Anyway, it plays uh, before the Renaissance, and uh, she is the illegitimate daughter of Lord Griffin. They have been uh, made homeless, really. Uh, they're staying with Donnelly at the moment, um, a lady who took them in. Uh, she has a wine shop. And uh, her mum is a embroideress. She does uh, superb embroidery. And uh, Carola is trying to find work for her mum. She's about seven here. We are in chapter five, The Strong Man. It was on the evening of a market day that my mother first sang for Donnelly's patrons. The room was very noisy. Two carters were wrangling in a corner and one of them, one of the dice players must have stopped at another inn before he reached ours. When she came in carrying her lute, no one took any notice of her. When she came in carrying her, her at first, her quiet, failing melody was lost, falling melody was lost among the raucous sounds of the wine shop, as the sound of a rivulet is lost when thunder is challenges a storm. But I think the very fact that they took no notice of her made her forget her nervousness. In a few minutes, her voice soared out, pure, pure and clear above the tumult, and gradually, one by one the men grew silent until her song was ended. Then they shouted their acclaim of her, and when she would have run from the room in confusion, they made her sing again and again. They laughed with her when her songs were gay, and when she played the lament for a dead mistress, they were as quite as mourners round a buyer. It was as though she had recaptured some forgotten power that gave her strength. Her eyes were brilliant with renewed courage, and I saw my mother I had known before we left the castle coming back to me. After this she played the lute every day, and the wine shop became more and more crowded. Sometimes she went up to the marketplace and sat by the booth of Donnelly's brother-in-law. At first she fingered the lute strings as if they were only testing, as if she were only testing the truth of their note, and the passers-by start stared curiously at her but walked on. Then she began to sing very softly as if to herself, and they would pause. Soon a crowd had collected, and only after she had finished singing did she pretend to discover that they were there. We never asked for money in the market, but the booth women got all the people who had been listening to the song to buy vegetables from her stall, and at the end of the day she used to give us a quarter of the day's takings. Some of the keepers of the other booths began to realise that their patrons were being enticed away from them, and they even told mother that if she did it again they would break her lute over her head. But she only smiled at them, saying, When the town herald announces that a new order has been passed, which forbids a woman to play a lute in the principal square for her own amusement, I hope I shall be fortunate enough to hear him, for surely it will be an order unique in my duchy, in any duchy. At the end of July, a fair was held in honour, I think, of the birth of a child to the house of Esther. Oxen were roasted over open fires and all the people in the town could eat until they had forgotten even the name of hunger. The fountain in the square ran with wine. It looked very pretty, though it ran dry long before noon. I heard a man grumbling that the wine was only from the dregs of the cask and even those did little more than colour the water, but as I didn't taste any of it, I don't know if he was right. As well as all the food that could be had for the asking, there was a booth where a man was selling slices of roast suckling pig and another one where they sold fruit syrup and brightly coloured sweetmeats. A ragged jester 
went amongst the crowd, crowd, banging people over the head with an inflated pig bladder on a long stick. I saw him knock off an old woman's cap and then pretending he had done it by accident, he handed it back to her with a stately bow and turned her anger into laughter with a quip. There was a dancing bear being made to do tricks by having a wooden spoon dipped in honey held just out of its reach. It had a collar round its neck which must have been too tight for it had worn the fur away. The man who owned it made it the foil for his humour. He would ask it a question and then pretend to repeat the bear's answer. I heard him pointing to a market woman. What do you do think of that fine lady in the red cloak? Then he put his ear to the bear's mouth as if he were whispering to him and said in a voice of mock horror, Oh, you rude animal, how dare you say such monstrous thing about a human being, even if what you say is true, she is still superior to you. He often cuffed the bear over the head, not very hard, but enough to make it look even more bewildered. It used to rub its face with its forepaws as if it were trying to hide itself away, and when it got tired of standing up on its hind legs and tried to go down on all fours to rest, it was jerked upright again. Poor bear. After a time, the crown crowd became bored and wandered away and the man tied the bear's chain to the ring and a hitching stone. Mother had given me two small coins telling me I could spend them as I liked so I thought I would buy something for the bear to make it feel a bit happier. I wondered what bears like to eat but before I could ask the owner he left it and went off to one of the booths. I stroked the bear and scratched his ears until it went to sleep just as Minetta used to. Its coat was harsh and full of dust and to its right side the hair was clotted around what looked like a knife's rust. When the bear leader came back he was very drunk and he went up to the bear and kicked him in the side. I pulled out, pulled out the long silver pin that Donnelly had given me and drove it as hard as I could into his leg. He bellowed and swung around. Then he made a grab for me and I had just time to say I hate you before I started to run. I thought I had thought he was much too drunk to chase after me but I found he wasn't. Cobblestones are very difficult to run on, and I was afraid of slipping, but I went much faster than I had ever gone before. I could hear the bear leader thundering after me and shouting out all the horrible things he would do when he caught me. With every step he got bigger and bigger, and I got smaller and smaller, until I felt as if I were being chased by an ogre. Just as I thought he was going to catch me, I saw a crowd and dived through it amongst their legs. I found myself in a little open space, ringed round with people who were watching an enormous man bending an iron bar as though it were made of plated leather. I heard the bear leader shouting, let me get at her. She has half killed me and I'll flay her for it. I saw him fighting his way through the press of people and I couldn't see any way to escape. Then I saw that the strong man was smiling at me and he said, what's the matter little girl? There's an ogre, I mean a bear leader after me. He's going to kill me. Please stop him. And as the man broke through the crowd and rushed at me, the strong man caught him by the shoulder. Then I don't know how it happened. It was so quick. The bear leader's arms were twisted up behind him so that he couldn't move. His captor said, Not so fast, my friend. You should not waste your strength on a child. If there is a fight in you that must be let out, I, Bernard, will do you the great honour of joining with you in a wrestling bout. He turned to the crowd. Will you be our patrons and provide us with a stake to fight for? They shouted their approval, for they had taken this yellow-haired giant into their favour. Now that I had stopped... Being frightened, I could enter into the jest, and at a word from Bernard, I snatched off my cap and carried it from hand to hand till it was full. There were even silver pieces amongst the bronze. The bear leader had forgotten me in his anger at being mocked. He drew a knife out of his belt, but Bernard caught his wrist, and the knife spun through the air. Always the bear leader's mad rushes were turned against him. Bernard sidestepped, tripped him, threw him a half score of times, and at last picked him up bodily and after whirling him around his head as if he were a sack of flour, he flung him into the crowd like a stone from a siege engine. I thought Bernard was the nicest man I've ever met. He said I must help him spend the money we had collected. He took me from booth to booth to buy syrup and sugar plums, and he gave me a little donkey carved out of wood with a real pannier and a skilled silk scarf to wear over my head. I asked him where he was lodging, and he told me he had only reached the town that morning and had left his pack donkey in the stable yard of the Grey Eagle. I said, the landlord of the Grey Eagle is a robber, and it is even whispered that some of his patrons have their throats cut if their money bags are too heavy. I had never really heard of the Grey Eagle, but I wanted Bernard to come with me to Donnelly's. I went on, if you come with me, I'll show you the best wine shop in town. 
where I am sure you will be very happy. You must come, please, because my mother will want to thank you for saving me. What will your mother say when she finds you have made friends with a strong man? Women of quality look on people of my trade, jesters and tumblers and murmurers, as fit, com as fit companions only for rogue and vagabonds. But we belong to the same trade as you do. Mother earns our lodging by singing to her lute, and I collect the money and make people laugh so that they will feel generous. People flock to listen to her, and they call her Olivia the Beautiful. That is the best news I've heard since the Jew my brother owed money to died, died off the palsy. You and a sweet singer and a strong man. Already we have the beginning of our own troupe of strolling players. Then he swung me up and set me on his shoulder. We must hurry, for I am impatient to see her, to see Olivia, whose name shall be joined with Carola and Bernard for the fame of Italy. When he reached the Great Eagle, we only saw a loutish stable boy, and I was very glad to find that the landlord was at the fair. Bernard looked into the pannier to see that nothing had been stolen, and then he let me ride on his back donkey, pack donkey, all the way home. Okay, that was chapter five, the first chapter or the first part.